I've been in the hospital the last few days, not because I'm sick, but because we got, we're adopting a little boy, and he's coming off, coming off of heroin, and so he's going through all that, that withdrawal, and I'm getting to pray over him, and not just him, a whole lot of babies, a whole lot of people, like it's actually been pretty amazing really has. Some of you need to smile. I know it's morning, but it's, Jesus is really amazing. Sometimes we hear that and we're like, well, I can't believe that, you know, a mom would do that. And a, a mom wouldn't do that if she understood what she was doing. You know, I got asked a question by a nurse yesterday because I'm, I share the gospel. It doesn't matter whether they're in a good mood or a bad mood. I share it. It just doesn't matter to me. Because Jesus is good news. And whether you got a bad mood or a good mood going on, Jesus is good news. And so I'm sharing my heart with all these nurses. And some of them don't want to hear it. But if they're sitting in my room, they have to. Because I can't be quiet. I have to share it with them. And I have hope to give them. And regardless of what they're seeing. Or, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of questions of people about God and who God is. And what do you do when this happens? And what do you do when... You, you see someone. So they asked me this question yesterday. They said to me, she goes, well, what do you do when someone says they love God, but they're, they're a homosexual? So I feel like this is like something that like is hard to talk about sometimes in churches because we don't want to hurt anybody. But the reality of it is, I just asked her, I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, I said if you have somebody that you know is in a, in a, in a homosexual lifestyle, and they're telling you that they love God and that you were at church and then here's another situation so I put out some situations because what we do is we elevate one thing over another and say this is this and this is this and this is this is the worst sin and this is a little sin this is, a sin is, is a sin but here's my here's my point to her I said you know suppose you you have that and you have somebody that tells you they love God and and, and when they say that they love the God that they know and I'm not saying that they don't love God well, let me, let me point something out. I said to her, I said, suppose you have that situation where you have that homosexual that came up and said, you know, you know I, I love God. How do you, what do you, what do you say to that? And she didn't say it with, with attitude, but she said, like, as a question, I said, well, what would you do? I said, if you knew that there was a homosexual couple that was there in church service and you knew that they were living that life and then, and then all of a sudden you found out that the pastor of your church was sleeping with the secretary but he was married which would hurt you more? well of course the pastor would I said well okay well how about you got this, these two people that are living in this sexual immoral lifestyle and I said or you have a boyfriend and a girlfriend that are sleeping together outside of wedlock you have that homosexual lifestyle, and then you have a pastor that cheated on his wife, but then you also have this other guy that's a professional businessman that's actually hooked on pornography behind the closed doors and no one's looking. I said, but then, but then, you, but then you have another guy that actually travels over to Thailand, and because he knows that he can actually, he can actually have sexual relations with little kids legally in Thailand because there are three-year-olds that are full-time prostitutes. Which is, I mean, which is darker? Which is yuckier? I mean, that three-year-old, well, that's disgusting. I understand and I agree, it's horrible. And then you got a pastor that's doing that and then you have, a, you have these two that are living this lifestyle and then this guy that's going over here to Thailand, he says, you know what? I actually love God. Well, you would say, well, your actions prove that you don't love God. Well, what about the businessman that's hooked on pornography that it's a secret that nobody knows, but he claims to love God and he's in a church? What, what is that? Is that okay? So she's asking me a question about this. She wants an answer about this, but here's the answer. The cross is available for everybody, and unless the blood of Jesus is understood and the price that Jesus paid is understood, then somebody can still live in this lifestyle and say that they love God. But the cross says that if you love God, this is not what you do. Uh, that's not me condemning anybody. I'm telling you the truth. See, it's a lack of relationship. It's a lack of intimacy and it's a lack of relationship with Jesus. See, no one wants to talk about this, but this is the truth. 
and I'm not saying that that pastor would never talk about this, but I'm, I'm telling you that that sin is sin, and it's dark, and it's yucky, and it's messy. And people say, well, I never sinned real bad. Well, let me just explain something to you. That's, that's self-righteousness, and if you think you're going to make it in by good works, you're in big trouble. Because there's no good works that will be justified by God. Because God says that all have sinned. And all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have. All people. Everybody has. Unless you understand and see the reality of what you've been given. And the price that Jesus paid for you. The simplicity of the cross. The simplicity that's in Christ. The reality of the price that heaven paid for you on Calvary then you can go through life and say you love God and live like the biggest hypocrite on the planet. I was at, I was at the, the store the other day. We went into a drugstore um, to Rite Aid. I had, to, I had to, I don't know, I forget what it was. Deodorant, I think. And I went in there and before we were headed in the hospital and I walked up to the front desk and my wife and I were there and I said to the lady behind the desk, God spoke to me and he told me that she had three herniated discs in her back. She just got a diagnosis from the doctor, a horrible one. So I'm there, and I said, hey, how are you? She goes, I'm doing great. I said, well, not too great. I said, you have three herniated discs, and you just got diagnosed. She goes, she stepped away from the cash register. She goes, you're scaring me. I said, it's not scary. I said, I'm a Christian. She goes, now you're really scaring me. (laughs) And I said to her, I said, but God loves you. She goes, okay, well, I have a problem with God. I said, all right. I said, well, Jesus told me about your back, and your back's messed up, and it's really messed up. She goes, well, I I don't really want to talk about it. I said, okay. I said, that's fine. I said, well, I'd like to pray for you. I said, let me see your hand. She goes, I'm not touching your hand. She goes, I I, I want you to stop. I go, okay. There's a reason why you want me to stop, because what I said about your back is real. She goes, it is real. I just came from from the whatever surgeon. He said that if they put a scalpel to my back, I will be paralyzed. There's no hope for me. I said, is what I said the reality of what's going on? She goes, yes, it is. She goes, that's why I'm scared. I go, well, that's not scary. That's amazing. She goes, no. She goes, really? She goes, I have a problem with God. I said, well, obviously your problem's not with God. It's with somebody that misrepresented God. Therein lies the problem. Because if I were to have somebody that's living a certain lifestyle and say that they love God, but it's against everything the scripture says. And if I were to have a pastor that claims to love God, yet he's sleeping with the secretary behind the closed doors, cheating on his wife and family. And if I were to have a businessman that says that he loves God, but yet he's hooked on pornography on a computer, and that's his life, and that's where he's feeding at, behind the closed doors, no one sees it. It's just a secret. No one knows. If I have somebody that's over to Thailand and goes and sleeps with a three-year-old prostitute, comes back and acts like nothing's wrong. Every one of those things is full-on hypocrisy, and the only reason that it's happening is because they don't know God. So one isn't worse than another. They're all horrible. Do you understand? See, what we've done is we've elevated one sin to be worse than another, but they're all equally as twisted. It doesn't matter what it is. Whether it's, whether it's this or it's that or it's this or it's that, it's all wrong. Are you with me? Are you sure? <laughs> there is hope. It's called relationship. See, the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit because He's holy. Watch this. This is, I know this is crazy. The Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit because He's holy. And Romans 8, 11 that we talked about earlier, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. If the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in us, and His name is holy, what should our life look like? It's not do holy as He is holy, because you can't do holy. You cannot in your own strength, and in your own, in your own pride, and in your own, I am so strong, I can do this. You will fall and fail miserably, because the devil will pound you, because you think it's all about you and your strength. But you have to realize that in your weakness, He's strong. And if you don't see his strength, then you'll rely on your strength, and your strength will fall short. Because there's none, 
none. No flesh will be justified. This is amazing. I just love it. I love the fact that this guy that said, be holy as he is holy is Peter. <laughs> this guy that really messed it up. I mean, he was the top messer upper dude. Are you with me? This is the guy that denied Jesus. This is the guy that was called the devil by Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. Your mind, you're thinking like a man and not God. That's what he said. Your mind is full of the things of man and not the things of God. Get behind me, Satan. So we can't, we can't go through this Christian life and just incorporate Jesus into our life. You can't just incorporate the Holy Spirit in just to have a better day or to have what you want. This isn't Burger King, dude. It's not have it your way. Come on, a lot of you aren't smiling. Get over you. Come on. You guys are my family. I should be able to talk to my family. I'm not being mean and I'm not being, I'm not being anti-scriptural. If you think I am, it's because you don't read your Bible. I promise you that this right here is a priority. It says that in the last days, people will be calling good evil and evil good, and that's what we've slipped into. We've called this thing that's good evil. Oh, hey, chill out. There are people that have gone to Bible college and, and they're, they, they have gone after the right thing and then gone over to this weird thing and says everything's okay, everything's all right. It's not okay. Jesus didn't lower his word or lower his standard. We've lowered our standard to make things culturally relevant and we've sacrificed truth on the altar of being culturally relevant. That's not a strong word, that's just the word. Huh? <laughs> what, shaking my head? Because my daughter's a dancer, she thinks it's weird. You go to India, they say yes that way. It's so crazy. You ask, are you healed? It's so nuts. I promise, they do. Are you healed? They're like, what was that? You see the whole crowd, I preached in a church. I'm, I'm preaching in this one church, it's an Indian church. And I'm like, are you guys happy? I'm like, what was that? And then they told me, and I was like, okay, sorry about that. That's true. It's really true. Guys, we can't afford to, to take this thing and water it down. And See, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world so that the world through him might be saved. It says that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation isn't to impute the world's trespasses against them. Jesus didn't come to impute them. He came to take them away. But if you don't see the ministry that you've been given, you might condemn somebody for something and have junk going on in your own life. And Jesus says, first take the, the plank out of your eye in order for you to take the sawdust out of your brother's eye. This, what I'm talking about, isn't judgment. I'm talking about the purity of the gospel. The reality of who God's called you to be. So I'm in this drugstore and I'm praying for, I'm talking to this lady and she's like, you're really scaring me right now. And I'm like, well, it's not scary. It's actually, she goes, no, I'm, I have, I have an, I have a problem with God. I said, well, I said, your problem wasn't with God, your problem's with somebody. She said, yeah, I had a husband that loved Jesus that beat me every day. I said, wow. I said, so you believe that Jesus was the one beating you? She said, no, but he allowed it. I said, he didn't allow it. See, we get this thing messed up, man. It's another whole huge twisted thing. Because if God allowed it, he could have stopped it, so you're blaming God anyway. I know this sounds crazy. I've talked to lots of nurses and I'm talking to lots of people in the hospital and there's a lot of this thing going on, especially when it comes to the area of sickness, loss and death. I talked to a young man yesterday that his infant son, he's in there, they're in there with their, with their little baby because his, his, his girl was hooked on heroin, he was coming off um, and their baby's in there, just got brought into the unit is being weaned yesterday was their first day and I walked in uh, over to them because I just walk in the hospital rooms man I just, hey how you guys doing you know I, I'm allowed to I just got to ask before they before I pray and, and uh, she looks at me she goes I know who you are and I said wow she goes I heard you speak before in Christ's temple I said that's awesome she goes please pray for my baby I said oh I promise I said but first I need to pray for your man he goes I got a beef with God right I said, you don't have beef with God, man. 
you have a beef with what you believe God is. If you knew who God was, you wouldn't have a beef with Him. You would have a relationship with Him. It's the difference between a beef and a relationship. I said, come on. He goes, you don't understand. I said, I, I will understand. You tell me and I'll explain to you. And I'll give you the scriptural truth about what really happened. And he said, well, how about this? He goes, I had a little boy. He goes, an infant. And some stuff happened since. He goes, God took my boy. I said, do you really think that God took your boy? You think he stole him from you? She goes, yeah. He goes, I ain't blaming him. I said, wait a minute. I said, you think that God stole your son from you. And now you're in a situation with a girl that, that you got pregnant and she was addicted to drugs just like you were addicted to drugs. You came off. She's still on. She's on methadone. I said, and your baby, this baby right here, you think that the same thing might happen to this baby. Let me tell you something, bro. Jesus is not a thief and he doesn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. So what happened to your boy was death, loss, and destruction. It wasn't God. And God didn't say, kill him and let this one suffer. That's not how it works, man. There's an enemy. I said, do you understand that addiction is from hell itself? It's not from God. And I'm not about to say, you're the one that did this. That's the last thing I want to do. Because then that brings guilt, shame, and condemnation because it crushes them and has them think, I'm the one that, that had this addiction and I'm the one that gave it to my kid. It's not about that. I'm dealing with all kinds of people in the hospital right now that are in that place of guilt, shame, and condemnation, kill, crushing themselves because they're the reason their baby's shaking. And that's not where we want to go with this thing. There is hope. His name is Jesus. Jesus wouldn't say, how dare you do this? And see, when, when I even share about the baby we're adopting, addiction in your city is horrible, okay? I've never seen a heroin addiction like I've seen in, in this area, ever. But we can crush this by the love of Jesus and the reality of you guys seeing and understanding who you are so that when you come upon this, you don't say, oh man, there's another one. That's not what we have. We don't have, oh, there's another one. We have Jesus, we have truth, we have the spirit of grace and truth upon our life. We can bring hope to a lost and dying world, but you have to be equipped to know who you are so that you can know the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Because we didn't, we're not here so we can condemn people or crush people or beat them up or saying you're bad and you're twisted and you're this and you're that. We're here to say there's hope. His name is Jesus. Look in my eyes. Do you see him there? And sharing the reality of who Jesus is. Are you guys okay? I didn't plan on talking about this, but it's pretty fun. It is because you guys get it every day. How many of you shop at Kroger's? All right. You walk by people with addiction every day. I've been in there every day. Every day, I, every day I do go in there, I see people that are hooked on drugs, man, that are hooked on stuff. And I have hope. I have a smile. I have the love of God to give people. I don't look away from them. I don't look past them. I don't walk away from them. I say, hey, how are you? I'm okay. What's going on? Why are you in my way? Because Jesus loves you. He's the way. I'm not in your way. He's the way. I want to share the hope and the love of God with people. I'm not, not because I'm an evangelist, but because I care about my father. It's not because I'm some super evangelist. I'm just a son, and I love Jesus with all my heart. That might be my title, but I promise this, that my title that I would actually have more than anything is a son that's in love with his father and that's the real truth and nothing but the truth so help me God <laughs> you guys alright this is really fun it's true though so so this lady behind the counter I said look I said Jesus didn't do that to you Jesus didn't beat you he never would have beat you if you looked at the life of Jesus in the Gospels you don't see him hitting anybody he would never hit you I'm really sorry that this has happened with him but God wasn't directing him to hit you, nor did God say, let him hit you now. That's not it. See, you can't have a picture of a father that's sovereign stamp sovereignly stamping decisions to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. You can't trust him. If you think that God is the one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, you have the wrong picture of your father. Come on, we got this whole thing with, in the teaching with Job and, and all this, well, you know, God allowed this. Look, we get this weird impression that, that Satan went and requested Job. 
Satan didn't request Job. God pointed him out. (laughs) Satan didn't say, hey, let me go get Job. God said, hey, Satan, devil, have you considered this one? He's amazing. There's none like him on the planet. He fears me and shuns you. He's awesome. One I created in my image. Yeah, one. None like him on the planet. (laughs) Satan says, does he fear you for nothing? The only reason he fears you is because of what you've given him. People don't love you. They just want your stuff. The only reason he fears you is because you've blessed him beyond measure. Take what he has away and he'll curse you. God says all that he has is in your power. Why did God say that? Did he say that because Satan asked for it or did he say that because Satan's the God of this world? Satan doesn't need permission to steal, kill, and destroy. He's a jerk. He doesn't need permission to attack. He just does because he's a jerk. But we haven't recognized our authority and our dominion and what God has really given us. So the enemy gets away with murder and then he slips away in the grass and blames the Father. So all of a sudden he comes in, bites somebody, and because we're taught that God's in control, whatever will be, will be. We lay our sword on a mantle. We lay our Bible on the pedestal. It collects dust. We don't really find out what the will of God is, so we really don't know what it is. Then we get attacked, we get hit, we get, and then we get theories and we get opinions from other Christians that really don't know God. And then all of a sudden, we live off of a theory or an opinion of somebody that got attacked before, and they've built their doctrine to who God is, instead of a loving Father, an amazing God. They blame God, because they don't know God. Then all of a sudden, you get deceived, and you have nothing to fight with. And your hands are bound, because God's in control, and whatever will be, will be. And if He is in control, then why pray? You might mess it up. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real simple lie that is destroyed by one that knows who God is. The will of God is found in Jesus Christ. He is the will of God. Jesus was the will of God made manifest. Jesus came down from heaven to do the will of His Father. Only to do the will of His Father. Only to do the will of his father he never said anything unless God told him to say it and he never did anything unless God told him to do it so if you want to know who your father is and how your father responds how your father heals and what your father does when demonic stuff is available that heaven is way more available to destroy demonic stuff and he does it through agency of the one we call holy So Jesus, when he walked this earth, he modeled and demonstrated the will of God in everything that he did and everything that he said at all times, minus none. He never, ever, ever acted on his own. He only acted according to the will of God every time, all the time, 100% of the time. And Jesus did not do what he did as God. He did what he did as a man in right relationship with God. Because if he were to do what he did as God, he couldn't have fulfilled the law which would have enabled me to be right with God. Jesus had to fulfill 613 laws and 10 commandments as a man, one made in God's image. Because God made a covenant with man and with God. God is holy, he has his end. In order for man to be right with God, he had to walk out 613 laws and 10 commandments in order to be right with God, missing none, because if you miss one, you transgress them all. So Jesus walked for 30 years as a man, born of the Virgin Mary. Come on. This is a big deal. We have to get this. We have to get God's will nailed down. You can't afford to be uninformed and and not know what God's will is in every, I'm not talking about some situations. I'm talking about every situation that you encounter, minus none. You cannot afford to not know what God's will is. We get it confused and think you can't know God's will. That's not true. The Bible says do not be unwise but know the will of the Lord. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove the will of God. In every case, you as a Christian, as a Christian, a Christ-like one, are required to prove God's will in every situation minus none. Are you guys, everything I'm sharing is completely biblical, I promise. It's, none of it's just my own guess. 
Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Colossians 1.15. It says that Jesus visibly was the exact image of God. It says it in Hebrews 1.3 that Jesus was the express image of the Father. The express image of the Father. That means that he was the splitting image, exactly like, 100%, just like Dad. Jesus was the Son of God. Do you know that Jesus came to reveal the Father so that we would know what the Father is like? The disciples said, Jesus, they didn't even know who Jesus was. I mean, come on, Jesus, like, who do people say that I am? Some say this, some say that. Yeah, but who do you say I am? I'm hanging with you. You're my peeps. Well, you're the Christ, the Son of God. Wow, blessed are you, Simon. Awesome job. I tell you what, upon this rock, I'm going to build the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The revelation of Christ. The revelation of Christ is the revelation of the Father. I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Are you guys with me? I'm in teach mode. It's really good. This is, this is really good. I promise, if this thing sinks in, you will never be subject to not knowing what God's will is. And you will know when the devil's the one touching you. You can't afford to put up with that junk. You can't afford to put up with the enemy's tactics. Fear is always from hell. Everywhere fear is, in every way, shape, and form, it is from hell itself. I don't care what you want to name it, fear is a devil. God did not give you a spirit of fear. That's a devil but of love and power and a sound mind. That sound mind doesn't come from strong arms. That sound mind comes from the truth being spoken into your soul by the very word that you put in front of you and the Holy Spirit being your interpreter. A sound mind where your mind, your soul is strengthened by who God says you are so that when the enemy comes in, I love to change the comma, when the enemy comes in, like a flood, God raids up a standard. When the enemy comes in like a flood, gotta raise up a standard. No, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise the standard. Just change it over. Who's bigger, your devil or your God? Come on, man. One person in Christ is dominant. One person in Christ is the majority. Which wins? The guy at the gatherings that's devils that was possessed by devils that was possessed by devils or one Jesus. This guy was possessed beyond possession. Legion. Jesus is like, what's your name? Legion. Get out. Go make deviled ham. Look. Everywhere Jesus went, devils feared him. They feared him because Holy Spirit was in and upon him. He was the anointed one. And now you as a Christian have the same Holy Spirit that is feared by every devil. The devil doesn't fear you. He fears the name of Jesus enforced by Holy Spirit. He fears Holy Spirit. Do you know that when Jesus was crucified and he was down there, he was paying the price? in hell paying the price three days paying the price three really bad days do you know that the day that Holy Spirit went down there it wasn't like he had to get Gabriel to get the front Michael to get the back I'm going in to get the sun you guys wash my back I don't think so dude light went and lit up hell let's go here's the keys let's get out of here it wasn't like the Holy Spirit was like no do you know because he's just not a mist and he's not a vapor He's God. God has given you the ability to house Him. He has given you the ability to be a temple that houses God. A temple that houses God. You have become temples for the Holy Ghost. You're a temple that houses Holy Ghost. He was with the disciples. He was with them. He wasn't in them. He was with the disciples. Jesus gave them authority. He said, go and crush hell. Go, boys. Go heal the sick, cleanse lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you've received, now freely give. They received the Holy Spirit. 
the authority that Jesus gave him. And it was a word, a Greek word called exousia. It was authority with them. But then Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, when he comes, he's not going to be exousia any longer. He's going to be dunamis. That's going to be explosive dynamite power of God that's in upon you. And it is to destroy the works of the enemy to where your mission statement isn't just going to be hide in a room because you saw me crucified. Your mission statement isn't going to be put a basket on your head. Don't tell anybody about the gospel. Your mission statement isn't going to be be afraid because they might say no. Your mission statement isn't going to be go inside the elevator and keep your mouth shut while everybody's talking about whatever they're talking about. Your mission statement isn't going to be when you go to a drugstore and a lady says, well, I don't want to talk about it. You say, well, okay, I'm sorry for bothering you. No, she's bothered because she doesn't know who God really is. She doesn't know who God really is. But if I know who God really is, then I need to give her the God that I really know. So that she can have a different picture. So that her getting beaten over the years, all the time, in the name of Jesus. So that people that are living a a, a lifestyle that they shouldn't, a sexually immoral lifestyle that they shouldn't. So the people that are wrapped up in pornography. So that a pastor that they put their faith in for years and years and years. That ended up leaving his wife for some other woman. They put their faith in a person. They didn't put their faith in God. And we have the opportunity to represent a God that's real. A God that's good. And a God that loves. We do. And we can raise the standard. We can raise the standard. And we can take the spirit of ugly off of God's pride. That's what we get the chance to do. But we have to know our God. We have to know who we serve. We have to know who the Holy Spirit is. You've been given everything according to life and godliness. All of heaven's resources is available for you to crush hell for a living. So the mission statement of the church is 1 John 3, 8. For this reason, the Son of Man was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. That is the mission statement of you, church. That's the mission statement of every Christian on this earth. Regardless. People say, well, I don't really like that charismatic stuff. It's a little crazy for me. Man, the devil's charismatic. Ah, He causes rage. He causes anger. He causes outbursts of wrath. All kinds of fits, man. The devil is so charismatic in a twisted way. Why wouldn't you want to just lift your hands? Why wouldn't you just take the basket off your head in public? Be a little charismatic and open your mouth for Jesus. Smile at somebody if you call that charismatic. I just call that the love of God. This isn't a pressure. You don't have to. You get to. Man, come on. This is our last lap. What are you going to do with the life that Jesus gave to you? Because people are dying every day in your city, on your job, in your school, everywhere you go. They are lost and floundering and they're waiting for somebody to light up the world, to actually have a flame that's contagious. People say, well, they're dry wood. Dry wood burns. Elijah didn't care what kind of wood it was. Soak it with water. It isn't going to matter because God's fire is coming and everything will be consumed. Even the stones were consumed. What would it be like for you to burn brightly? Even if it would be for one day. Even if it would be for one hour. Even if it would just be for one moment. Just for one moment. Where you're in a carpool construction, guys, and you're driving down the road and everybody's just doing what they do. They can be smoking weed, whatever. He told everybody, hey, I just want to tell you that Jesus loves you guys and has a plan for your life. Shut up, man. But it doesn't matter. See, the reason why they said shut up is because they're just groaning. They're groaning. All creation groans and is waiting for the sons of God. That's you too, daughters. Daughters, you can be called sons if I can be called a bride. Either way. All creation is groaning and waiting for the sons of God to be made manifest. Groaning doesn't sound like, please tell me about Jesus, please, I need to hear, please. Groaning sounds like, get out of my face, I hate you. Oh, you're just groaning. Don't tell them that, but that's what they're doing. Just realize when that thing comes, your war is not against flesh and blood. 
He wars against principalities, demonic strongholds, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Your war is not against people. It's against their belief system. They believe twisted stuff. Why don't you represent the real deal? Represent the real deal so they can see something real. And don't just try to seal the deal and headlock them into praying a prayer. Don't. You're not, your job is not to headlock somebody into praying a prayer to get to heaven. It's not about that. That's not your goal. Your goal is to represent Jesus well. Your goal is to be an imitator of Christ. Your goal is to have faith in the seed that you sow. Your goal is not to have faith in you bringing the increase. Because you don't bring the increase. God brings the increase. And if you would dare to just step out with this little life that God gave you. God gave you this little life. What are you going to do with the little life that God gave you? Whether your time span is this long or this long. You can have one day and represent Him more in one day than people have done in 50 years. All it takes is you to be vocal about the God that you believe in. The love of God that's in you. Let it consume you. Dare to open the Bible. Dare to believe what God says about you. Don't be afraid. Who cares about the devil? He's a withering branch. He's been cut off from the source of life. There is no hope for him. He is cut off and he is dying. One day he'll be chained forever and ever and ever. Don't let him yank your chain. He's going to be chained. It's not about you being afraid of what he says. Don't you wake up on eggshells every day and, oh, I wonder what's going to happen today. Don't you even. Who cares what the devil says? And if he tells you you're a failure, thank God that you're not a failure because there's no failing in love because love never fails. If he tells you that you're worthless, say, thank you, Father, I am worth the blood of Jesus. If he tells you that you're never going to be anything, thank God that that means you're really something. Who cares what the devil says? He's a liar and he wants to create you in his image. And he is trying to reproduce his seed right here in your soul so that you can be a Christian that has someday I'm going to get to heaven. But never believes that heaven has gotten into you. So that you can destroy hell. You can destroy hell, hell with the heaven that's inside of you. His name is holy. His name is holy. I looked at this lady and I said, hey. I said, look, you don't have to touch me, but I'm praying for you anyway. You can hide or whatever. I'm praying for you and your back's getting healed. Because God wouldn't have just said that to me and played a charade game with me. He never sends forth his word unless he produces fruit. Because it always bears fruit wherever it sends it. And she says, well, I don't want. I said, well, too late. I didn't go, give me your hand, give me your hand, give me your hand. I backed off from the counter because I don't need her to touch me. It says the prayer of faith will save the sick. It says the prayer of faith will save the sick. And so we prayed for her. And my wife was with me. And man, if you heard the testimony of my wife and how it used to be, she would have ran out of the drugstore. She stood right there with me, closed her eyes, and she prayed with me. This is a big deal because I'm an embarrassment. I don't, I don't play with this thing. People are going to hell, man. Uh, why would I be more concerned about what people think about me? People are dying every day. I can't live with that. I can't live with the fact that people might not be around tomorrow and I might be their last chance. And that's everybody's responsibility as a believer. You don't have to preach a 10-point sermon. It's not about trying to preach 10-point sermons. It's about knowing that God loves you. And you're talking about the love of God. Well, I might not be able to disciple him. Stop reading into this thing more than you have to. Some sow, some water. God brings the increase. Wouldn't you just help me sow? Wouldn't you just help me water? Really, I, I have this urgency, this passionate urgency inside of me to bring the reality of conviction into people's lives. Not because I want you to be like me. Nobody can be like me, but nobody can be like you. And you are the best you that God created you to be. Somebody's dying for you to say Jesus loves them. Somebody, a waitress, they're smiling, they're hurting. They're smiling and everything's okay. It's not okay. Trust me, it's not okay. Somebody at a drugstore, odds are they're there for a reason. If they're at a drugstore, they might be picking up medication or something. They might just not be getting deodorant. They might be. The people that work there might be hurting. The people that are there might just need a word from God. 
And that word could be, God really loves you. You know you're 100% right every time. 100% right. You can never be wrong in Christ for telling somebody that Jesus loves them, paid a price for them, gave his life for them, and rose from the dead for them. And when they say, well, how can you prove you rose from the dead? Say, let me pray for you. Let the Holy Spirit be the best evangelist that there is. Because I promise, he's better at this thing than we could ever be. And if we would just dare to believe that he's in us and upon us, we would actually have something to give. And you would watch God show up in a way you never saw him show up. And I promise you, man, I've trained people all over this earth. We train people to go out there and to touch people in Jesus. We train them. It's the craziest thing when someone goes out there and prays for somebody. And they're, they're stepping out for the first time. I remember just testimony of a little girl who never stepped out before, seven, seven years old. Um, is it okay if I pray for you? And the people, oh, honey, that's sweet. And they let her pray. Oh my gosh, all the pain's gone. She said, really? <laughs> like, tell me where faith is. It's crazy. When you search to find faith, you'll never find it. Faith is like an eyeball. It is. It never sees itself. Try to see your eye without a mirror. Look and see. Try to see it. You can't. Because faith looks out. It doesn't look at itself. It's amazing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not yet seen. Faith says that God will do what He says He's going to do. So I'm going to step out and do what God told me to do. And then God's going to do what He said He'll do. Well, I don't know if God will do that. That just means your picture of who the Father is needs to be clarified and put into motion. You need to see who God is through the life of Jesus Christ. Because everyone that came to Jesus, everyone, when it made whole, and went away whole. Everybody that asked for prayer, he never said to them, hey listen, I'd love to pray for you, but you need more faith, come back when you get some and then we'll deal with it. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. As a matter of fact, people have problems with healing, but easier time with salvation, but most of Jesus' ministry was healing. <laughs> he spent more time in those three years teaching, preaching, and healing than he did even talking about salvation. But salvation is necessary. Being born again is essential, but it's to unlock your potential. He talked about being born again one time. He talked about healing and the kingdom a hundred different times. It was on, man. He never said to somebody, listen, I'd love to pray for you, but you, you know, God's perfecting something in you. He never said that to anybody. And if sickness was from God, then Jesus healing it would have been going against God. People say, well, sometimes God puts sickness on people to teach them a lesson. Tell me one person that Jesus told that to. People say, well, you know, someone has to be in unforgiveness in order for them to be healed. There wasn't a voice from God for 400 years before Jesus stepped on this earth. John the Baptist was the first voice in 400 years. John the Baptist wasn't the real light. He was testifying of the light to come. Jesus was the light. And in him was the light of men. What was that light that was in Jesus? That light that was in Jesus is the same light that's in you. The Holy Spirit. God says you're the light of the world. Man, a light can't be hidden under a basket. No, a light lights up a whole city. A whole city set on a hill. Come on, a light lights up his own house. That means if your house is dark, it's only because you have a basket on. Take that thing off. Actually believe that you are who God says you are. Stop listening to people's opinions and open up your Bible and find out what God says about you. Find out what God says about you. Stop listening to every teaching that's out there and having so many tools in your tool belt that you're weighed to the ground, don't know which one to use. Start to find out who's the utilizer of all them tools. His name is holy. Holy Spirit, and God wants you to know that He's in you and upon you, and He wants to touch the world, He wants to crush hell through you. <laughs> so I told that lady, I said, hey, God loves you. I said, I'm going to be back. She said, okay. I said, you alright? She goes, no. I said, how you feel? I don't know. I said, alright, bless you. And my wife and I went out to the car. I said, that was awesome. And then some lady ran out to the car. She goes, hey. <laughs> She's another worker. She goes, what, are you do to, what did you do to her? She looks at me. I said, I'm a Christian. She goes, yeah? Well, tell me something about me then. <laughs> like, I'm a fortune teller. 
I shared my heart. I shared God's heart for her. I said, this is who you are. This is what you've been through. And this is where you're going. See, we don't trust that God will actually give us words to say because we don't step out in faith and actually step out there for him to use you. You step out there, God will give you words to say. God will speak to you. The gifts of the Holy Spirit aren't for you to just hoard them to yourself. When we pray, God, give me some gifts, give me some gifts. You've got to use because as you step out, more will be given. To he who doesn't use, even what he has will be taken away. You've got to step out. Why would you pray for more if you're not willing to step out in what you know? Here's what you do know. God loves me, paid a price for me, forgave me, removed my sin, set me free from guilt, shame, and condemnation, and he wants to set that person in front of me free, just like he did me. That's the basis. So now, Father, I have to thank you for this person in front of me. Hey, listen, God loves you. Well, I don't care. Well, he does. Bless you. Have a good day. Shut up. Okay. Bless you. That's how it happened. My daughter was with me. We get rebuked all the time when I started praying for people. We get in elevators. How you guys doing? Okay. Jesus loves you so much. And then everybody's quiet. It's true. And then I start sharing even more. And then people start turning around facing the door because they can't wait to get out. It's crazy. I had a guy rebuke me in the elevator. He does not. Said, yes, he does. His little daughter's there. Nine-year-old little girl that's a Christian. I can see a little cross on her neck. And her daddy's drinking. He's not a Christian. He hates God. He's angry at God. His daughter's a Christian. And I said, yes, he does, sir. No, he doesn't. I said, what are you going to do? Hit me, man? If that makes you feel better, then go ahead. But I was an alcoholic and a drug addict for 22 years, man. And he loves you. And it took me getting shot at so that I could know. And I'm not about to walk past you and have you have to get shot at to find out what I already know. I should be dead. And I am. I died to me. So you go ahead and swing away. God loves you, man. You can't kill me because I'm never going to die. The little girl goes, because that's her daddy that she's praying for to be saved, but everybody's afraid of him because everybody's all worried and concerned about what people are going to look at them like. And maybe they're going to look at me weird. (laughs) Who cares what people look at you like? You think that I don't get some weird looks? Oh, I promise you, I get some weird looks. Do you see this? I get all kinds of weird stuff. All kinds of weird looks. I tell people about Jesus. Huh? We were praying for you just a minute ago. I used to go into churches and sit in the back. People didn't know I was a speaker. I'd come up front. People would repent after service. We prayed, for, we were praying for you. God, save that man. We realized that we don't even know if we're saved. Not because I'm super, because I just am a basic, simple, Bible-believing, blood-bought, spirit-taught, Holy Ghost-filled, possessed, laid down his life so that other people can have life, denied myself, pick up my cross to follow him, read my Bible every day, believe every word that's in there. I believe that God wants to use me, he wants to use you, and the only one that holds us back is ourselves, because Jesus has already paid the price to give us everything that's available according to life and godliness. Really. The girl at my car, this girl at my car, she looks at me, she immediately bursts into tears. Oh my God. She said, she said my girlfriend, because she's in a lifestyle, my girlfriend is addicted to drugs. She goes, and I, I keep telling her that she needs to find God or something. I said, what about you? She goes, I believe in God. I said, I know, but what about Jesus? There's many gods, but only one Jesus. She says, well, well, yeah. I said, no, how about this? How about you let me pray for you? So I prayed for her. She burst into tears. She says, oh my God. Oh my God. I said, look, God wants to touch this girl. He wants to set her free from addiction. And I told her about uh, us adopting, and she just started crying even more. Oh my God, that's so beautiful. I can't believe you do that. I said, I'm in the hospital touching as many as I can. I said, but God wants to set you free and her free. She goes, okay, we need freedom. I said, yeah, come on, let's pray. So Jesus just wiped her out in the parking lot. Why? Because he can because what looked like it was repulsive and offensive is actually attractive because darkness can't handle it see when you walk into a place and you represent light darkness has to flee devils aren't afraid of you going to a building 
Devils are afraid of you becoming the building. Devils are not afraid of you coming to a Sunday service. Devils, are, and I'm not, this is an amazing church, and I'm not saying anything bad about it. It's amazing. Devils are afraid of you finally finding out who you really are. So they work overtime to try to crush this thing so that you have a theory of God and say that you have a relationship with God from the one time that you said yes to Jesus at an altar 25 years ago but have done nothing with the gospel that you say you know except come to service and be faithful he wants to keep you silent he wants to shut you up and he wants to get you focused on everything that's twisted and all the things that are wrong instead of the way that is right and his name is Jesus I promise and I'm not I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. If the shoe fits, kick it off because it's not your shoe. That is not your shoe. You can make a line in the sand and say, I am not going back. I am not going back. I am going to represent Jesus everywhere I go. Would you stand with me? Wow. He's really good, I promise. Just put your hands on your heart for me, please. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for everybody in here. God, I thank you. I'm asking you for massive conviction, God, that we would be more convicted when we walk out of here than when we came in here, God. That conviction wouldn't turn into condemnation because it's not about being condemned because there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. God, I thank you that we would be a people that would walk according to the Spirit, that we would be a people that walk possessed by the Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for every person in here, every person in here being able to know the hope that is in them, that is Christ in them, the hope of glory. I thank you that the hope that's in them would come out of them and that hope would be made manifest.